call the Germantown School District um, or School Board meeting to order January 22nd at 7 p.m. Uh, item one, official meeting notification, Mr. Reuter. Public notice of all meetings has been given by communication from the superintendent's office to the public, to those news media who have requested such notices, and to the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, Northwest Now, Express News, and West Bend Daily News. Public notice has also been posted in schools throughout the district and on the Germantown School District website. Uh, item 1B, we will take roll call and then conduct a pledge of allegiance followed by a moment of silence. Uh, Ewert. Here. Uh, myself, Barney is here. Loth. Here. Pollock. Here. Higginbotham. Here. Brown. Here. And Medved is absent excused. I'll rise if you're able for a pledge of allegiance in a moment of silence. Thank you. Item two, approval of agenda. Motion to approve the agenda. Second. Time with the motion to approve. Mr. Pollock with the second. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. That passes. Item three, reports. Item three, a district administrator update. Dr. Chris Quitter. Thank you. Uh, this evening, is, actually today was a teacher work day for staff um, as they concluded the first semester, um, as our students did on Friday, and tomorrow we begin second semester. So that is 18 weeks of school remain in the school year. Hopefully the weather cooperates um, moving forward. Uh, I'd like to honor two students who have graduated at semester as GHS students, uh, the first being Ricardo Pavon, and the second, uh, Connor Barney, son of Tom Barney. Congratulations, Tom. Thank you. This last, uh, over the last two weeks, Mr. Nowak and myself have conducted focus groups with teachers from across the district in multiple disciplines as a continuation of our compensation study. Uh, and we will be bringing our findings and themes from that compensation, uh, those focus groups through personnel next month in February and then a full report to the board. And um, some great news. Uh, February starts uh, Career and Technical Education Month, and State Superintendent Dr. Jill Underlay and her team have reached out from DPI, and they'd like to do an on-site visit the morning of February 5th to uh, watch our programming in action and um, honor our school for great, the great program, programming it has. So um, we're excited to host and highlight our great teaching staff in those departments, as well as the great work our kids are doing. So um, just wanted to make that public as we enter Career and Technical Education Month in February. And that's all I have this evening. Thank you. Uh, item 3B, Student Representative Report. Good evening. Okay. New Year, same fantastic adventures over at Amy Bell. January is buzzing with excitement as the students embark on a journey of learning and enjoyment. Winter map assessments and classroom evaluations are on the horizon to track academic progress. This month's character trait is perseverance, a quality we emphasize daily in the classroom. Students will explore ways to apply perseverance, not just academically, but also at home, in extracurricular activities, in various aspects of their life. But it's not all about hard work. Fun awaits the students, from popcorn Fridays to amazing animal presentations to school-wide assemblies and field trips. There's fun for everyone. And let's not forget about their annual Super Bowl challenge, where students and staff can place bids by bringing in uh, boxes of bags of soup uh, and vote for their Super Bowl winner. Excitement is in the air at Amy Bell and let the fun and learning contend. The Comets are excited about the snow at recess. This month they are focusing on their character trait of perseverance. Teaching them the importance of perseverance at a young age sets the foundation for future success. Popcorn days are adding an extra dash of enjoyment this month and the grand finality is the PTA movie night. The students can't wait to snuggle up and enjoy a movie and create lasting memories with their friends. Happy New Year's from MacArthur. 
Last week, they joyfully celebrated student growth and achievement with the Snowflake Scavenger Hunt. This creative initiative aimed to recognize success by rewarding classes that followed expectations and found all the hidden snowflakes around the school. The friendly competition added a delightful atmosphere to the building. Ensuring that continued learning, students from kindergarten through fifth grade will undergo their second round of map testing this month. To add to the festivities, the school will also be celebrating General MacArthur's birthday on Friday, thanks to the support of the PTA. At Rockfield, the new year is all about embracing perseverance. They're guiding to students to understand the significance of development, developing tools to navigate challenges, encouraging growth in moments rather than giving up. Throughout the month, students will learn various strategies to overcome difficulties. These strategies encompass deep breathing, movement breaks, flexible thinking, and goal setting. Happy New Year from the Crusaders. The Crusaders jump back into the swing of things to start off 2024. Today marks the start of second semester, so the teachers and students are eager to see what their new classes will bring. KMS students are gearing up for the American Heart Challenge on January 18th and 19th during their PE class as part of the service learning program. The learning vibes are strong at KMS, extending into after school activities. Boys basketball and wrestling are in first full swing with the Key Club collecting over 15 boxes for donations to Friends Incorporated. The Science Club conveys every Wednesday and the KMS ski and snowboard team is eager to hit the slopes with over 140 members. Excitement fills the halls at GHS as students and staff gear up for their new semester. With the semester exams wrapping up last Friday, everyone is eager to dive into their new classes and make the most of this upcoming year. The winter sports season is in full swing, keeping our student athletes engaged and our school spirit soaring. Last Wednesday night, high schoolers embarked in athletics and activities, organized a co-curricular fair for the incoming freshmen. Witnessing the next class explore their future options was thrilling, but we, as, before we look ahead, GHS is determined to finish this year on a high note. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a lot. Uh, we appreciate the report and the effort that goes into it. It's great to hear uh, from the student body and what's going on around the district. So thank you very much. Uh, 3C, Amy Bell Elementary School presentation. Ms. Cole. Hello. Good evening. So um, I brought uh, three of my teachers here tonight to talk to you a little bit about um, their student learning objectives. I'll just give you a little bit of background and then I'm going to turn over to them so they can um, talk to you a little bit about specifically what they're doing in their classrooms. Um, so you can see part of our educator effectiveness um, is that teachers are creating student learning objectives. They're measurable goals that are created for student learning. Um, we take our math assessment. We just finished taking the mid-year math assessment. So a lot of the learning objectives were based on uh, fall map data along with classroom assessments. Um, the teachers collected the data and were able to identify a target group of students, um, a portion of their class, or it could even be their whole class that they wanted to uh, focus specifically on, and then created a plan that aligns with the standards and the curriculum. And then along the way, we're monitoring student progress. So our um, set of math results that are just finalizing was a way for them to take a look and see um, the progress that they were monitoring, how that came out on a standard measure. So I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to hand it over, and um, we have third grade first. Uh, so I have Allie Wandry and Tammy Kiesling. They're the third grade team this year. We have two sections, so they're going to talk about what they did to create their um, learning objectives, and specifically about some of the data that they have from their classroom. Thank you so much for having us. We're excited to come here tonight to share with the board the progress that the third grade has been able to make during the first semester in reading. The third grade team is currently piloting the Wonders Reading Program. There is an oral reading fluency component for both whole class and small group instruction. As part of the pilot, we administered the beginning of the year oral reading fluency placement and diagnostic tests to all third graders in mid-September. This showed us their words correct per minute, which is abbreviated WCPM, so you'll see that on a slide in a little bit. Oral reading fluency is important because fluent readers don't have to concentrate on decoding. Instead, they can focus their attention on text meaning. Oral reading fluency has consistently been found to have 
a higher correlation with reading comprehension. Using the norms that Wonders provides, the average or the 50th percentile for the words correct per minute at the beginning of third grade is 83 for a third grade level text. The test results revealed that 23 of our students scored below the average for oral reading fluency. After discovering that 62% of the third grades scored below the average, Tammy and I decided that this was an area that we must focus on to help our third graders become better readers. And because of this data, we created this SLO statement. By the end of the year, students in the target group will increase their fluency to meet the beginning of the year norm, which is that 83 words correct per minute. Students have been meeting on a weekly basis in a small group setting. Part of their small group instruction focuses on fluency. Instruction has been given on accuracy and expression through explanation, modeling, practicing, and applying. Students have been given differentiated genre passages in the small group. Students frequently and independently practice to increase rate, accuracy, and expression. We have assessed the target group four times since the initial assessment to track the student's progress. Tammy and I are very pleased with the outcome so far this past semester. Our targeted students have improved their fluency rates since September. Most students have significant increases with their rate, and the average increase was 16 words per minute. We're also encouraged that 39% of our targeted students have met or exceeded the end of the year goal within the first semester. We are very fortunate that we have small class sizes. Tammy has 18 students and I have 19 students. So we have more opportunities to have individual conferences with our students. During these individual conferences, we provide the students with powerful feedback on their accuracy, rate, and expression. The students are very proud of their progress and are motivated to further improve their, um, their rate and their fluency for the third, uh, second semester. Thanks so much for letting us share our students' accomplishments with you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to introduce Chelsea Level next. She's teaching fourth grade. Um, fourth grade teachers, their whole team focused um, their SLO on key ideas and details. They found that was a, an area that needed improvement based on their fall map. Um, so they created their target group from students in the low, low average category for that specific instructional area. You can, on map, you can um, delve into instructional areas, and that was one that they found um, students needed work on. So I will turn it over to Chelsea and she can talk a little bit about how she worked on that with her class. Thank you. Um, like Katie said, um, I really looked at my map data from my students in fall and by looking at the areas where they needed the most extra help, um, I created my target group, which is four students um, that sc scored significantly lower on the key, detail, or key ideas and details category. Um, so, Thankfully, due to my lower class size, um, I was able to meet with this group two to three times a week um, for 20 minutes a session each. Um, so right here, this is an example of what a lesson would look like. Um, it takes a week. So there are, um, <coughs> the focus of this particular lesson that you're looking at is focusing on repeating words to help students determine what the main topic is. Um, at the start of the lesson, we talk about the strategy that we're going to be working on do a warm-up activity together, and then after the warm-up, students have the opportunity to independently practice what we just talked about, and during this time, that also allows me a chance to informally assess them to see how they are applying that strategy on their own. Uh, this next slide is actually examples of one of my students' work. The left-hand side is the warm-ups, so in warm-up one, that is one that we do completely together, and then in warm-up two, it's the same task, they just do it independently. So in one and two, there's a short paragraph, and they're asked to pick out one to three words that they're noticed are repeating a lot. Um, so in the first warm-up, they're talking about dogs, smell, and scent. Um, so the main topic of that paragraph is dogs. Um, and then warm-up three and four, this would be the next day that we meet with them, where they're still reading a paragraph, but then instead of picking out those repeating words, they are using that strategy to then just tell me the main topic of that paragraph. Um, the right-hand side then is what we would do next where they get a passage and there's little checkpoints on the left-hand side that they're asked to do after they read a certain paragraph. 
to again point out what are those repeating words. So in this one, clearly it's about mosquitoes. Um, and then at the final end, they're supposed to create a title that would go with that passage that relates to the main topic. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide, thank you. Um, so what I did is that I then was able to really dig into my fall and winter scores. Um, at the top is their overall math score. So this is including the key idea details, that's including vocabulary um, and all the different components of math. Um, but the bottom, um, I was able to take it one step further, and as you can see, my students did a tremendous job in this category, um, with one of my students bumping up their score 24 points, uh, which is a 15.1% increase. Um, so they've been working really hard at this. They're also very proud, and I am extremely proud of them. This particular group, I am going to continue doing this with them, even though they did score so well and they clearly showed growth. I just want to make sure that they're maintaining these skills and not just doing it for a little bit and then working on something else. Um, so I'm, like I said, um, I'm extremely proud of them for what they have done. Um, and I cannot stress the importance enough of smaller class sizes because this allows me the opportunity to meet with them more often and for a longer amount of time uh, to really give them that one-on-one -on -one attention that they deserve to help them become better lifelong readers. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions for any of them? Or me? It doesn't look like it. I just want to say thank you for coming and giving this presentation. Uh, typically, when we see a building presentation, we get the kids in here. I think it was fantastic to hear from the staff and kind of highlight the work that goes beyond standing in front of the students, uh, working with Jake and the curriculum learning marrying these two discussions and what we had earlier this evening it really helps to under the board to understand and getting the community to understand the totality of the work that's going on so thank you for bringing your team and thank you for coming uh, 3d gsd annual assessment report mr miziak miss leeson good evening uh, tonight we're here to present the annual assessment report as we did last January. <clears throat> the purpose of the annual report is to provide a snapshot of the student performance and indicators of student achievement and growth. So each section of the report includes student performance on assessments and key information related to the interpretation of those data. And tonight in the assessment we will highlight some key components of the report. So the first thing to note is our overall state report card. And on the screen, you can see projected the annual performance for Germantown over the last four years. Um, <clears throat> again, one of the concerns that uh, has been in the community at large and it's kind of been a national discussion is um, the impact of the altered education that took place during um, COVID and then shortly there following. And you can see that um, as a district, we're continuing to grow and we've increased in terms of our overall district score. The overall district score contains four separate components, uh, achievement growth, target group outcomes, and on track to graduation. At each one of the levels, those components um, vary slightly. Achievement and growth and target group outcomes remain the same at all of our buildings where on track to graduation is scored slightly different at elementary, middle, and high school. Um, in terms of the weight that the state provides to those categories, the biggest difference would be in the area of growth. Growth is impacted by the proportion of students who meet criteria around socioeconomic status. So as that proportion of students increases, the proportion of the pie that our state report card scores uh, for growth then increases as well. So MacArthur has um, our highest proportion of students from that um, category of socioeconomic status. So the, the growth portion of their pie is the, the largest. So these are the four areas that she, um, are represented on the state report card for all of our buildings as well as the district. Um, this year, if you were to do a comparison for achievement, growth, target group outcomes, and on track to graduation, those four areas we saw increases um, from last year to this year.
Okay, um, this table shows the ACT score for the past five years. Um, one thing to note is last year, the 22-23 school year, it was the first year that our uh, 11th grade students took the ACT online versus paper and pencil. And you will notice that there was um, no dip in score. So we're excited about that. Um, we are consistently above the state average in all areas for the ACT. And um, you'll see that we even increased in some areas from the prior school year. Uh, this gra these charts show our pre-ACT secure. So pre-ACT is taken by our ninth and 10th grade students. It used to be called ACT um, Aspire. Last year was the first year of the pre-ACT and the state switched it so it was more closely aligned with the ACT. The experience is very similar for students and actually staff proctors. And um, you you'll notice that our students scored above the state average in all areas as well. The ninth and 10th graders do take the exact same assessment. So we do expect that the score for our ninth graders to be lower because they have one less year of instruction uh, when they're taking this assessment. Uh, this next chart shows our advanced placement scores. Um, any student scoring a three or higher is considered passing. Last year we had 85% of our students uh, pass our advanced placement tests. And we also saw an increase in the number of students taking advanced placements test for that school year. And each one of the individual scorecards that you see for, or state report cards that you see for our buildings, they have this um, table that's included for each one of the buildings. And then this is the district-wide summary for the forward assessment. So you can see overall as a district in both ELA and math that there's a common trend in terms of the number of students that we have that are scoring in the advanced range, um, colorblind. So I'm not gonna tell you the color on the bottom of that chart, but whatever color that is. A shade of blue maybe? Yeah. Blue? Is it blue above it too? Purple. Purple. Uh, so the blue and then the purple, um, that re represents our students who are proficient in advance. So uh, as a district, when we're looking at trends within buildings or we're looking district-wide, that's the trend that we want to see. We want to see that that bottom um, portion of the graph that represents advance is continuing to grow as well as the piece right above it, which represent proficient. The other um, component that we can look at is the Obviously, you're going to see decreases in other areas. So our students who are below basic, which is represented by the top color, um, we're looking for that to reduce over time as well. Uh, when we get our scoring form in the state of Wisconsin, those areas are, um, you get different weights for each one of those. So you get zero points for the students who are in the basic column. You get a half point for the students who are basic, uh, a point for students who are proficient, and then a point and a half for students who are advanced. And that factors into the overall scoring that our district receives for the state report. Okay, the next area that we're gonna share with you is our NWEA map assessment. So our, our teachers talked about how they've been using map data to analyze student growth and achievement. So um, map is given three times throughout the school year in the fall, winter, and spring. And this is the first year that we've rolled it out to K2 students as well. Last spring we piloted uh, the map assessment with K2 and we decided to move forward with administering it to now K-8 across the district. Our uh, kindergarten students only take it twice a year starting in the winter, so they had their first math assessment this month. This uh, graph shows the past three years of data collected through our math assessment. Now just be, uh, we just rolled out the, um, the K-2, so um, this chart shows us first through eighth grade, but the next chart I'm gonna talk about um, only shows us uh, fourth through eighth, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, this is projected proficiency for reading. And what projected proficiency means is predicting if our students will be proficient on the forward assessment, which is taken in the spring. So you'll notice we have three years of data um, divided by different schools, so each color is a different school. And you'll notice that in reading, uh, we see um, our students are about 40% about 
50% of our students across the board are projected to be proficient in reading on the forward assessment. Now, um, Jake and I did some analyzing of this and comparisons, and we found that this tends to be a conservative estimate based on what we actually see in forward, and we actually get a higher percentage of students who are advanced and proficient on the forward assessment in the spring um, in instead. And this is the same graph, and this is for math. So again, projected proficiency on the forward assessment in the spring. Uh, the math is more closely aligned to the scores that we see on the forward assessment, um, usually within a couple percentage points. Uh, the next two charts are uh, achievement and growth for our math assessment. So this is where we're only looking at students in grades four through five and then six through eight for Kennedy. Um, the reason why we're only looking at those grade levels is because this uh, report looks at students' growth over the course of one year. So for example, we'll take the fall score for 2022 and then we'll take the fall score for 2023 for the same student and it will tell us if they met or exceeded their growth goal um, that was projected. And um, using this data, what we do is then I, we compile the percentage of students who met or exceeded that growth goal. So you'll notice there are three years worth of data and in three of our five schools, we had over 70% of our students meet or exceed their growth goal, which is great. And then um, this is for reading. So the first one is math. And then you'll also notice that there was a significant increase in the past two years um, of students achieving or exceeding their growth goal in reading. And at this time, Julie and I would take any questions that you might have regarding the assessment report. Mr. Barney? Just looking at this last chart, and seeing the jump from, you know, I'll just pick up county line, from 33 in 2021 up to 53 and then to 63.8. Do you have anything to tell us why that may have happened? You know, what the jump was, is there change in curriculum? Did we do something different in the classroom? Um, <laughs> Julia had pointed out one of the significant differences last year is we did focus a little bit more on the map assessment and that data. Um, the 2021 school year, you could make an argument that the education that students had received the previous year may have resulted in a little bit of a disjointed education and what you might be seeing there is the recovery piece. Um, as this is three years worth of trend data, uh, it, it's nice to forecast that and we will continue to gain more and more data so that we can look at this more longitudinally, especially when we look at our um, younger students so that we can see those cohorts of students over time. So with that information, we could, we could start pointing to certain things. So um, if we went to um, next year when we're taking a look at the implementation of a new reading curriculum, we can point to that as information for are we seeing the growth that we anticipated for this? Is there an implementation dip that we're noticing where there's our, our growth data doesn't seem to mirror what we anticipated? Um, at this point in time, there wasn't a significant um, adjustment in terms of the curriculum that teachers were using. Um, there have been work at each one of the buildings in terms of um, their engagement with things like the science of reading where they've, they've focused more heavily on some of the core components of that. So that could potentially explain the, some of the shifts that you see, but you're, you also might be seeing the rebound from um, that disjointed education that they may have received. From the COVID year. Yep. Yeah, got it, thank you. Do we have any information from the 2019-20? Because that would give us, you know, is that because there was, you know, the learning from home, um, online learning, because is there that jump or was it before was, you know, were we in the 60s at Amy Bell and you know what I'm saying? Was there an actual drop? We just don't have that information. To we know. don't have that data. We have some of our data from the forward exam. So you can, it's not, again, it's, this is projected proficiency. So you can take a look at how we were scoring on the forward exam to see that there, there was a dip that had taken place from the pre-COVID to, you know, the, the years following. But then 
within all of our schools, you're seeing that recovery of more students on forward being proficient in advance. Because what's interesting is you didn't see that decline in math. Math pretty much stayed, you know, consistent throughout. So I guess it, yeah, I found that. The, so one of the other things to consider with, um, with growth is it's students hitting their growth target. So that's taking each student individually wherever they're at right now. So if they experience some learning loss, um, it would take that start value and then project forward the expected growth for that student. Um, so growth um, versus achievement might look a little bit different in terms of those graphs. So the achievement part you can look at in terms of forward. For growth, uh, we have to take that individual student data to see how much they've grown. And it, it's relatively tough to do when you're using forward data given um, the forward scale changes with each grade level, so the scoring isn't one-to-one. -one. Uh, there isn't like a, a useful comparison for students other than were they low basic, basic, proficient, or advanced because of the score shifts that happen from grade level to grade level. So measuring growth in individual students using forward is um, not something that I would recommend. Uh, additionally, NWA did a research study post-COVID after to measure learning loss based on the national norms. There's a higher rate in the United States of learning loss in reading than in math. So when you look at this math chart, you see it leveling off more because the rate of loss wasn't as great as in reading um, because of all, many factors, the type of instruction that was occurring, engaging in, in you know, rigorous work, those types of things. So the NWA will even say nationwide, the regression in reading outweighed the regression in math during the shutdown in that period of time. Taking a look at the uh, reading scores from 20, 2021 to 2021-22 across our elementary schools, three of them are pretty much in line with each other with the recovery of 20 points. Uh, one of the school has recovery double that. It'd be interesting to see what happens specifically there or if that low number in 20, 2021 is just an outlier or bad data. I mean, anytime we have three schools within the same standard deviation and an outlier, and it looks to be a very good success story, that's the kind of stuff we want to be focusing on and replicating if there was something that attributed to that. Well, just in, in trying to kind of understand this, if I'm understanding this correctly. So when you do the projected proficiency, so say for, you know, for Amy Bell for 23, it says 41. Is that we think 41% are going to hit projected proficient, Proficient right? or advanced. Yep. Okay, so then, but then we look at the achievement growth, and it's 61. Does that mean 61% of the 41 hit there, or does it mean we've actually done better than what we projected? 61% are now <coughs> proficient. So for growth, a student could hit their growth target, but maybe they started out in the below basic band of the forward, mm -hmm. and then they jumped up to the basic band. So they made, they could have made a lot of growth to go from below basic to basic. So they would hit their growth target by MAP standards. So MAP, you could say they're measuring their growth. How much did they grow? versus uh, proficiency is just an achievement level. So did they make that achievement level? So you might see a student not really grow at all, but they were proficient in third grade and then they were proficient again the, the next year. They may have even kind of reduced within that band. Um, so what growth measures takes into consideration where the student is coming in. So you could see a lot of movement within each one of those areas. So they're, they're measuring two separate things. So how much did the student grow within that year? Um, and then whether or not they reached that proficiency level. And like Julia said, uh, what we're noticing with math across all of our buildings is reading tends to be a little bit more conservative in terms of its projections in terms of how many students are proficient in advanced. So if you were to take any one of these schools and then compare it to their state report card, uh, the 
the projected proficiency that you see, for example, at Amy Bell is underneath what they actually achieved in terms of the number of students who are proficient or advanced on the forward. Uh, for math, it's a little bit, it's pretty close in terms of what math is predicting. So if I take a look at some of the, uh, like the forward data, and anytime we see growth in, in uh, the, the lower end there, the low portion of the graph being the blue and the purple, that, that's higher achievement. And anytime we see shrinking in that yellow and the orange, specifically the, like the, the not test, uh, meaning someone didn't take the test, it looks like we have more people potentially involved in it and taking the test. Um, that's all, that's good, right? And, and the, no, the other numbers that we're talking about, but I think it's important to remember that we, we layer all this data over itself. Because we could say, look at all this great work we did in forward, and if we went back and found out all we did was teach the test, then, then it would probably fail our students, but we have great forward scores. Um, so, so that's why I think all of the data that's involved here and the layering of it and the understanding, I, I personally don't think we teach the test. So when I see this growth, it's organic, it's, in, right, it, it's from the process that's developing, which is a good thing. Um, I, I do like to see the numbers that we are seeing. Obviously, we always want to see see and push more, but I think it's indicative of the process that's going on throughout the district and the intent that's being placed uh, um, honestly throughout the district and improving across the board. So it's, it's great data to see. It's encouraging to see. It's a portion of what we use to analyze what we have going on. Uh, the layering of it definitely helps understand it a little bit better. And that the test participation is something to note. So. Um, Julie and I worked with uh, principals and then teachers last year to increase the number of students who were taking the forward exam. We had noticed that we disproportionately had a higher number of students who uh, were in special education who were opting out of taking the forward exam. Uh, and then we've, we've doubled down on the importance of why this data is important for not only our district, but for our teachers to help understand student growth. Um, so the number of students that you see there that did not test that has gone down significantly. Um, that's more students who have IEPs who are now taking the forward exam because that was the largest proportion of our non-testers um, was a, a student from that um, particular group. Anything else for us? Anybody else? Okay, well, I appreciate the information, the report. As usual, it's fantastic. In depth, we continue to grow in that aspect. Uh, could, do you have more to continue with that, or are you, you finished? Okay, thank you. Uh, item four, citizen comment, I have two. Start with Heather Peak. She has an informational announcement for us. Hello, everyone. I'm just here to do a quick uh, plug for our upcoming winter play, Murder on the Orient Express. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's a uh, murder mystery. We have about 40 high school students involved with it. They're working really hard. And it is going to be right here at the PAC, not this weekend, but the weekend after. <coughs> we have a show Friday, uh, sorry, excuse me, Saturday, February um, 3rd at 2 p.m., one at 7 p.m., and Sunday at 2 p.m. on the 4th. Uh, so if you're interested in seeing it, invite your friends and like it on Facebook and share it. And uh, get your tickets online from the uh, PAC website. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have one more. Uh, Ellen Goldtree. Hi. I just wanted to make a couple comments. I didn't actually have anything really written out, but in regards to the open enrollment spots and the 30 additional 5K seats, um, a couple points I wanted to make is I was just wondering if you guys had considered the additional um, developments that are happening all around Germantown and whether or not how many children might be enrolling from those additional housing projects that are, that are coming up all over Germantown that I'm seeing. Um, so that was my first point. And secondly, and more important to me, I guess, is the 
special ed comment here. It says in the packet, it says that the special ed services are already at capacity, so students with special needs will not be accepted. Um, I just wanted to point out that I have three kids in Germantown, and I had two kids that were on IEPs. My daughter was put on an IEP after kindergarten because she needed additional speech services, and she was on that IEP all the way through elementary school. My son was put in an IEP in second grade after uh, um, he had got diagnosed with ADHD and he got diagnosed with anxiety and I'm actually happy to announce that he's in eighth grade and just earlier today he was removed from that IEP from our amazing special ed teachers uh, here in Germantown. So some of those diagnoses aren't actually known before entering school and that would be two thirds of my children so 66% of my family had been in an IEP after the 5K um, Grade. So those are just some things I wanted to point out and make sure that you guys were considering. But as always, thank you so much for everything you do. I appreciate all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Item five, consent agenda. Item A, approval of December 18th, 2023 meeting minutes. Make a motion to approve the December 18th, 2023 meeting minutes. Second. Uh, Ms. Higginbotham with the motion. Mr. Barney with the second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, consent agenda B, approval of teacher resignations. Uh, tonight we have <clears throat> Laura Supernand submitted her letter of resignation on January 5th, 2024. Laura was hired in August of 2012 as a science teacher at Germantown High School. Thank you. Um, as far as any particular reason why or attempt for retention that you could give us some insight on? Yes, we spent considerable time um, talking about this situation and the departure of this teacher. This is a teacher who, um, in her uh, over 12 years of time, and especially in the most recent years, has evolved into being a department leader. She holds a dual certification. Um, as well as uh, she's involved in many extracurricular activities and is well liked by students. So uh, we're very concerned about this. We um, uh, collectively discussed uh, an offer, a, a considerable increase to salary uh, in an attempt to retain. Okay, uh, and I apologize, we didn't have our personnel committee meeting. Uh, so I'm gonna take a little time here uh, on this topic. Um, uh, for many of the reasons I think you, you just cited, we're kind of sad to see this this direction. Uh, this teacher taking uh, resi choosing resignation it sounds like she's joining another district. Um, it sounds like from further conversation, there was a great deal of attempt for retention. Uh, we just weren't able to get it done on that side of it. Uh, I do appreciate. I know we've talked about in that committee creative solutions to this. I think this is a, uh, the approach to the retention attempt in this was considerably different than prior. So I think there's a notice to be served on that end of, of a proactive, that's reactive to the situation, however proactive in, in the, the style and attempt for retention. But do we, as far as replacement, yes. that direct replacement, do we have replacement, anything like that? Um, um. We are uh, very close to securing a, a teacher. Um, this particular packet is uh, completed middle of the week and late in the week and Friday we um, have secured a teacher. We just need to go through some background checking and physicals and those kinds of things to secure the teacher. Uh, this is a uh, first year teacher who's completed student teaching. It's an excellent opportunity for and we're excited about the opportunity. At the same time, as we've said, it's difficult to see an experienced teacher leave. Absolutely. I appreciate the update on that. I mean, it's the swiftness we were able to bring somebody in. Obviously, we're gonna lose the, the experience side there, um, and you'll have time to address that end of it as we continue forward. Uh, but knowing we have somebody coming in in that time frame is better than we've had been. Right? Yes. So it's an improvement in that. So I appreciate your hard work on that. Um, 
Does anybody else have anything on this topic? No. I'm going to stand on accept the motion. Make a motion to approve the resignation of Laura Supernan and thank her for her service to the students, their families, and the Germantown School District. Second. Mr. Barney with the motion. Mr. Pollock with the second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. That passes. Approval of teacher contracts. Item C. Thank you. We have one contract uh, coming forward tonight. Um, as was just referenced, this was uh, based on a resignation that occurred um, at least a couple months back. This is for Amanda Hunt, an English language, an Eng English learners teacher, uh, so serve multiple schools in the district. This is a 1.0 limited term contract for 99 days at 35,952. This teacher comes to us with um, strong experience in the neighboring district as well as at WCTC. We're very excited about what she has to offer and she's extremely excited about being here. Fantastic. I will entertain a motion. Move to approve the limited term contract as presented. Second. Uh, Mr. Pollock with the motion, Mr. Barney with the second, any discussion? I'd just like to say I appreciate that. It sounds like this is not an entry level. Teachers, some experience coming along and the enthusiasm that she's going to be bringing into the building is going to be fantastic for us. So, uh, with that, all in favor? Aye. 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 That passes. Item D, approval of donations. This evening we have five donations, and I'm going to read them as follows. Piggly Wiggly has donated $1,428.25 to the Germantown High School Athletics and Activities, Badgerland Striders Running Club, $300 to the GHS Boys Cross Country Team, the Germantown Area Chamber of Commerce donated $200 to the Germantown High School Marching Band, Rockfields PTA donated for playground equipment, valued at $3,270, and Warhawk Band Boosters donated $3,149 for transportation of the GHS marching band. We'd ask that you approve all donations this evening. That I'll take a motion. Motion to thank the donors for their generosity and approve the donations as listed. Second. Taken by with the motion, Mr. Barney with the second. Any discussion? Just, just for clarity, the Badgerland Striders was 350. I think it was right. stated as 300. 350. 350. Just for clarity. We appreciate the 50 extra points. Yes, we do. <laughs> uh, anything else? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That passes. We are moving on to item. Six policy committee meeting. Uh, Mr. Barney, I believe you're going to have the comment. Yes, uh, policy committee let, met last week Monday. Um, we discussed two policies that are both coming forward with recommendations, so I'll move right to our next board item, 6B. Um, this policy is policy 2521, the selection of instructional materials and equipment. And this policy is being revised to include the definition of instructional materials and instructional equipment to distinguish between the official curriculum provided to the students as opposed to teacher-created lessons plans, content, and various forms of media. So committee brings forward with a positive recommendation to the full board to approve the updates and modifications to District Policy 2521, Selection of Instructional Materials and Equipment, with the edits as discussed at committee. It comes forward with a positive recommendation. Uh, we do not need a second. I would open it up for discussion if there is any. If I could just add, there is also, um, not that they're board approved, as they can change at any time, but we did include in the packet administrative guidelines that Mr. Bisiak and I worked on, um, and that's something we'll continue to add to as we um, move through the curriculum review process. Now, I would like to add, so I'm on, I'm I serve on this committee, uh, and there was some interesting material in here, and as far as 
continued food for thought. Uh, I think we may have missed an opportunity to provide a level of transparency within some of our supplemental materials that are mentioned in this policy for our community, the parents, students, uh, the, for this board and, um, in general. Um, I don't have language I would like to recommend in order to support that, that effort of transparency right now. I would like to see that the committee potentially bring this back with kind of a furthering conversation around that. Um, I'm going to the committee chair of that. Yeah, certainly. I guess what I would recommend is move it forward as it is tonight so that we have a policy in place. And then next time committee meets, which I would imagine will be later this quarter, we can revisit that and discuss uh, your proposed language. Sure. It would be yeah. great. I'm, I'm due to meet with Neola the middle end of February with the next round of spring policies, which will chunk out so we don't have 60 of them one night. But um, this can be added to the list. And as I've shared at policy committee, I think this is one that Neola will continue to revisit, similar to some other policies as things evolve um, across multiple districts. Sure. Yeah, it's, I think it's, it's a, the reason why I wouldn't provide language now for it, I think there's a, you know, we need a better understanding of the cause and effect of what that potential language could bring, uh, not only to the, the district administration, but our staff on a, on a, a burdensome level. So uh, we'll continue that conversation. I appreciate the openness for that. So uh, if nobody else has anything on that topic, I'll take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 That passes. All right, the next item, uh, item C, approval of proposed policy 2133 class size. You had an initial look at this at our board meeting in December. Uh, committee took a second look at it last week and did not make any changes to the proposal. Uh, this is essentially the, the district procedure that has been in place, but now it's being solidified in policy. Uh, having in policy will allow the community, parents, <coughs> and, and staff to understand our class size expectations, as well as assist the administration and the board with finalizing staffing and budgetary items that we have to do every year. Uh, from a high level, I will go through the policy at um, 4K. The desired class size is 21 or less students at K-5 through grade two, the desired class size is 23 students or less. Grades three through five, desired class size is 25 or less. And at grades six through 12, across core academic, coordinated arts and electives, the desired class size is 27 or less. Um, band and choir um, will have varying class sizes based on coordination between the teaching staff and administration so that they can meet their objecti objectives and expectations, and the policy also calls out uh, special considerations that may be necessary. So with that, committee brings forward with a positive recommendation to the full board to approve the new Germantown School District Policy 2133 class size. It comes forward with a positive recommendation. Any discussion? Yeah, I just have one point on that. I've received a couple of questions in regards to this um, over the last couple of weeks and since the committee has met. I think it's important to note we're not racing to these numbers. The goal isn't to be, uh, to fill every class to this, but, but it is to set a structure, a known structure uh, for the administration to, to move forward with and continue on planning. Um, but that was probably the number one concern I heard. Obviously, and we, like we've heard it tonight, right, with class size. Uh, I don't think that's the intent. Uh, so I know we can read into this a little bit about let's race to 20 or 27. I don't think that's the goal here uh, in, in an honest fashion. So I just wanted to clarify some of that. Uh, if nobody else has anything, uh, I would take a vote on it. All in favor? Aye. 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 That will pass. Nothing else from committee? Thank you. Item seven, finance committee, Mr. Lope. Yes, the finance committee met earlier this afternoon at 4.30 p.m. Uh, the meeting was just about an hour long. So this is going to be what I call the Cliff's Notes version of that meeting. Um, Ms. Wendy Unger with Baker Tilly uh, presented the 2022-2023 financial audit. There were no findings, and uh, really the audit was 
very good. We have a excellent business manager, so we were kind of expecting that. <laughs> uh, next item is uh, 2024 mileage and meal reimbursement. This is full board item this evening, 7B, and the Finance Committee brings forward to the Board of Education with a positive recommendation to approve the 2024 mileage and meal reimbursement rates of 67 cents per mile, breakfast $12.50, lunch $17.50, dinner $22.50. Comes forward with a positive recommendation. Uh, not needing a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 That passes. Okay, um, next item. We went over the uh, vouchers. There were a few questions on vouchers, and we approved those. Next item, we uh, covered, Brittany covered her variance report. And the last item was a property tax review. So I got a few calls, uh, why are my property taxes going up? I really can't uh, do it justice here, but um, the Finance Committee meeting is recorded, and you can see the whole meeting. Um, this part of the uh, 2024 property tax review is towards the end of finance. So if you're really interested in that, skip to the end. Um, one thing that has happened, it's not the only thing that has happened, but uh, we have inflation. So uh, taxes are calculated on inflated property values and taxes went up a little bit. Not bad, but a little bit this year. And that's all I have. I appreciate you bringing that uh, discussion for it in the committee. Um, I think the nuances in school board finance, I think uh, Eric can probably attest to that some of the conference training he just attended this week, the nuances are vast and important. Um, so thank you for pushing that conversation through in your committee. Yes, even I learned a few things or had a few things clarified for me this evening. So it's a good listen and listen carefully. Absolutely. You know, if you choose to do so. Absolutely. That's it. Thank you. Uh, I will, uh, item eight, teaching and learning committee. Uh, that was me. That was this evening. Uh, I'll kind of give you the cliff notes as well. That one went over 45 minutes, almost an hour, I believe. Uh, two topics, both just reports, no decision making needed, uh, but hopefully some impending. Um, we're going to start with the academic and career planning um, updates. Uh, obviously, last time, year about this time we heard on pathways and the continued work around that. Uh, I think we're building some structure to that uh, in accordance with some state statutes uh, as well as um, outside of the requirements, the intent and purpose is being given its due diligence to push forward a, a more robust program. So we learned about our educating for uh, employment in our portal, um, our uh, portrait of a grad. Um, both of those things will work. Uh, one is a guidance and second is a, a follow through rating, uh, less outward to the student and more internally um, for staff as far as we're setting goals and seeing if we're meeting those goals or what, what portions of the goals we're meeting or where we may, to, may need to reemphasize or refocus. Uh, I won't go into the, all of the details on it, please give that a lesson as it's a continuation from our pathways discussion from this time last year. Uh, fine. Me, Mr. Ewart, I'm sorry, I was fixing this projector. Did we um, approve from the finance committee letter B the real uh, and mileage reimbursement? Yes, we did. Okay, I apologize. We took a vote. Is that okay? Yep. You know, I was technical <laughs> difficulties. Oh, so okay. so. Just not for you then. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, we then heard on the uh, reading pilot update. Uh, the committee's worked ex 
extensively on this. We're in report number five, which is two more than I think we intended. Uh, we've kind of clarified why that is. Um, the good news is this time around, uh, the state has provided us the three that we have been piloting do make their cut. Uh, we are waiting for one more data point, which is reimbursement or grant eligibility for those. And that'll be uh, a portion of the decision. But we found a, a, had a lot of data provided to us um, this evening. Um, one being around the teacher evaluation portion of that process, not only from a, a, what they, what the evaluation was, but they took a d in depth look as to what, what they were evaluating in each category, and did that make sense? Was that the totality of what we wanted to look at? Um, we found a couple of things out through there. Um, all the programs seem to be good. Uh, we're, we're probably in good hands with any one of them. Each one may have a, a, um, a shortfall here or there, um, but we found that that could potentially be a, a process. So Jake and his team were able to rework the data that was collected um, and kind of reverse engineer it as to what could we increase those scores or what was the potential cause of those scores. And it seems like they found some pretty specific and finite things. Um, so I think it's a good, it's a good opportunity to see in both directions what could potentially work and what couldn't and what we could do to improve those areas. Uh, so we'll continue to look at that. It was also a great way for the, the uh, evaluators to provide upwards leadership and information and input into that. So we appreciate that. We found um, parental feedback as well, which is fantastic. Um, a couple of the programs, one of them I believe was a little more um, We'll call it forced, but communicative towards the parent or the household uh, than the others. And we're thinking that may be why we found more participation because it was more forward facing to those households um, than some of the others. So we'll continue to monitor that as well. Um, we have MAP scores, which will receive that data that we can compare specific to kind of before and afters of uh, participation in the pilot program. We'll have that coming. We are looking for no decision tonight, on, unfortunately, on either of these as the reason stated before, but we are hoping in the next month, potentially, to have that brought forward to finance for uh, an expenditure decision and then ultimately the full board approval following that. So we appreciate all the hard work that continues to go into that. Uh, we'll note the, it does seem like the extended time that we've been allotted thanks to the state. <laughs> so, uh, a slow process of review, uh, it has allowed us a little in-depth, further in-depth process. So I think we're in a good position as we move forward. And that is all I have on that. New business, item 9A, discussion and action 2425 open enrollment seats, Dr. Reuter. Thank you. Uh, this evening, after consulting with our now loose um, policy related to class size, Ms. Altendorf and the financial aspect, working with uh, my assistant, Melissa Timmerman. We are proposing 36 open enrollment seats at the kindergarten level, not specified per building, as we look to um, monitor our enrollment numbers. That is a number higher than this board has ever been brought before. Um, the rationale behind this, if we look at our projected enrollment, our current 4K population, what we expect to come possibly from the private sector, um, our current staffing plan and our capacity within buildings. Um, we currently have eight uh, sections of 4K or eight FTE, and at 5K we have 14. We have two teachers on limited term contracts due to uh, additions the board approved in late August when we saw an ens enrollment spike. Um, at this time, we would need to most likely moving forward, even though we'll continue to monitor enrollment, um, either lay off current staff at the elementary level um, regarding the, the, the low 4K going into 5K and or um, move teachers around, um, which is not the best um, staffing model to consistently move teachers from grade level to grade level as they, they start to master a grade level and then they're moving elsewhere. Um, 
So we have, we have looked at um, historical data over the last three years in 2021, 2022, we had 127 applicants for open enrollment in the district spanning 5K through 12, only 16 of those were for kindergarten. In 22-23, we had 194 applicants for open enrollment in the district. Only 14 of those were for 5K. And in this past year, for the 23-24 school year, year, we had 149 total applicants and only 12 of those were for kindergarten. Um, something my team does every Monday morning, we pull a data report from Skyward, an enrollment data report for um, projected for next year. So we can monitor 4K and any new re possible residents for the upcoming school year. Our, our kindergarten numbers projected for next year are staying steady as of this report at 146, which is our roll up from 4K. We have had not had any, to my, re in my knowledge, Mr. Mizak, you pull that data for me, um, 5K new enrollees. Um, so our, our idea to bring forward 36 seats is possibly two full sections but they would be dispersed throughout the district as we see um, lower amount of kids coming into the district. This is part of birth rate recession. Every school district is seeing this at the early grade levels. Um, and, and I know it's, it's, it's a larger number than the district's ever brought forward, but we think um, the recommendation is positive for stabilizing grade levels so we can build a consistent staffing plan to um, be consistent with our staff as well as from a budgetary standpoint, be consistent with knowing a projected average enrollment year after year versus a fluctuating enrollment. Additionally, um, Mrs. Callan and I have spoken, we would not be allowing any new open enrolled students in the, of those 36 that currently, or that would have an IEP from early childhood or 4K. Um, and at any student, we have the right under policy and state law that any student who open enrolls into the school district, um, regardless of the grade level that you approve a seat at, if they qualify for an IEP after that, they can be, um, we, in order to receive services, they'd have to go back to their home district because it's undue financial burden on the school district and they came in under a different pretenses of general ed student versus a special ed student. But that would be a an administrative decision based on resource allocation and um, current caseloads of our special ed staff. I will open up this for what is undoubtedly a topic of conversation. Mr. Barney. Uh, of the current open enrollment students that we have, do we see a higher level of disciplinary issues with them compared to resident students? I would have to dive into that, but our open enrollment numbers are so low. Historically, like last year, we approved, I believe, this was it, less than 10 seats total, and they weren't even all picked up. Yeah. Um, since I've been here, it's been less than 10. Um, so, comparison to the other 3,900 kids, I would say there's probably more disciplinary issues with the population of 3,900 than a handful. Um, we've, the last two years have been only at fifth grade open enrollment, um, which the argument to open enroll at kindergarten only, not only to stabilize staffing and class size and number of sections in each building, we also get kids into our system very early on. So if there's any need for, um, in, to intervene around academic or social progress, it happens early on versus at older grade levels and they're put into the system. And now they may have been in a neighboring district for six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, and to change that mental model or shift around academic and um, their whole child aspect is much more of a monumental task for our staff um, and a utilization of our resources versus early on where they become part of our district, um, even though they don't live here. Where I understand the reasoning for, obviously if we're low on our enrollment for 4K, 5K, but again, the fear is if the district, the village, is planning on adding housing, I know they were doing a big housing um, to see what kind of housing we need, whether it's apartments, you know, next-gen housing, and we all of a sudden now have a big influx of um, students where we aren't doing, you know, as we say we have 36 seats available, but as they, you know, go through the school, you know, for a second now, so we don't have room for them, now we've, you know, it's. 
what, are we doing justice to you know, even those kids coming in that now there is no more room for them and they have to go find another school? So I guess, you know, if, if we can somehow work with the village and see what kind of, you know, residents were coming in so that we don't put students in a, in a bad spot. I, um, this afternoon, reached out to village administrator Kreklau as that we were all forwarded tonight's uh, meeting that's coinciding with this meeting to attend, which obviously we can't be at both, um, regarding um, proposed housing in the village, as that was um, somewhat news to me on, based on previous conversations I've had with the village. Um, so I'll get clarity on that. One of the pieces, and Melissa, correct me if I'm wrong, um, DPI does allow us to add, come back in June to add seats because um, after the open enrollment window has closed based on our current um, our current student population or enrollment at that time is that correct so we could we could tonight um, if the board chooses it just might be difficult with our staffing plan um, and, and forecasting forward as middle school and high school students have selected classes for the fall over the last month now we start to cascade down from the number of FTE needed at middle and high school based on electives and core courses, and then that our last piece of staffing is at the elementary level, and we determine based on enrollment, but also the total number of FTE in the district that we'll bring forward to you in the next month or so um, for you approve, to approve contracts. It's going to possibly lead, as I said, to preliminary layoff notices. Um, to It could be to a couple, couple teachers in the district. But we do have that option that if you were to not approve any seats this evening, or a minimized number of seats, we could come back in June and open it back up for more seats. But, so, but with the caveat that people who have already selected their school for open enrollment have been accepted, that pool might shrink. And that's why I wanted to share that historical data that we've had no more than 16 kids apply over the last three years um, at 5K. Um, I'd like to add a little context, I think, to that number. So. Uh, Prior to moving to the village, we were an open enrolled family. Um, and we understood, and through that process, you pick three locate three three districts, uh, and, and three only, and you rank them one, two, and three. Uh, it was widely known within the circle of some of the city workers that I worked with that you do not waste one of those spots on Germantown. Um, so as if we were to open 36 spots in one grade, and obviously that message would get out that we were open. I would think those those in asked in rolling numbers would jump uh, astronomically, because I know I would have. I had spent time with kids in two different school districts, Sussex and Germantown, and they both, or Sussex and Menominee Falls, and they both did a good job, but ultimately it wasn't the district we wanted to be with. We just knew it wasn't um, a good strategy as parents of open enrolled students to attempt to come here because of the low uh, offer rate. Um, and you mentioned in regards to a student coming in, we wouldn't be asking, uh, we wouldn't be allowing anyone with a special education track. Um, I would agree with their citizens' comment from earlier. I think a lot of those situations are probably found out down the road. And, and while legally, we're, we are probably of the right to ask them to go back to their originating district. Ethically, would that be the, the best solution for the student at that time? And I know it's take, a common take, practice, taking the, take, taking, the, yeah. uh, taking the financial side, and I'll get to the financial side of this here in a second, but ethically, um, I, I, where would that process lie? Is that with you as the administration or the board providing you that, that authority? or you would be asking us to make that decision? That would be with administration. We look at current resource um, and then determine if it is feasible. It's a common practice in other school districts that you were not accepted under that term. Sure. And it's going to cause undue stress on our, our resources, human resource, and financial resource. I, I would look at it in this light, and I don't know if I'm in the minority on it, but we'd be asking them to come in uh, in their enrollment well, I will call it in the easy process of education, would be a financial benefit to the district. But as soon as that financial benefit flips to a, a burdensome approach to the district, and because it gets hard 
we would then ask them to leave when they need it the most. That would be a difficult decision sure. I think, to make. We currently have students who came in under open enrollment over the last 15 years that have qualified for special ed and have not been asked to go back to their home. So the, the district's pract current practice or potential Previous administration's current practice. Okay. Uh, so lastly, the financial side of this. Um, if, we're at, if we're saying, uh, two questions here. How is it that they're only at kindergarten that we have this lack? Or you're looking for We're looking at a long term that, versus utilizing a short that term. to push through over the years. To stabilize building up. Because right now we have oddities in our number of sections based on enrollment, where you might have a two section track or a three section track at a school in first grade, and then would, second grade's four. I would so we're going to have internal movement again this year. Sure because we have these odd number of sections year after year. The goal is to stabilize. I'm hearing you on that. Um, obviously, I think that stabilization would be no, more noticeable at the elementary levels, right? It would be uh, versus once they're dumped into the middle school and then back into the high school. So we're, I would look at this more as that track of elementary that we're looking at, trying to stabilize, yeah. not the entirety of the system. Um, Next year, if we project the same low enrollment, are we now not on a loop to continuously add open enrollment and add open enrollment? Um, if this community doesn't come through with the housing and the family migration we're expecting, or potentially hoping for. So I feel like we get ourselves into a looped track of continuing just to simply boost our numbers when our own population is telling us uh, we don't support this level of staffing. And while absolutely unfortunate, the tough decision on the staffing side would then have to be made, um, it, we wouldn't be tracked into that. And sure. I've seen in other districts, I've had discussions with other boards around open enrollment and some of the runaway aspects or train that they can kind of get themselves on because that money coming in is now needed to stabilize the, not only for staffing but the entirety of the budget. The third part of the budget side of it would be we would receive less dollar per head coming in through open enrollment than we would through a natural student, right? Natural enrollment student. Say that, I'm sorry. We would receive you. less, less. My understanding was the, the dollars the district, the home district would have to pay our district is less than what we would receive for our own uh, in-district student. The state rate is $8,962 per head. So it would be short yep. of the eleven. That's so, so now we're not only in a loop of needing to continue to add those students to maintain, but we're doing it at a reduced rate. And then we're taking our taxpayers' money to make up the loss in that 8000 to the 11000 mark. Correct. The thing, the other risk we run is um, we could be running class sizes Though we heard tonight, and I agree to keep them within range of the policy, but also lower class sizes, we could risk running at, like this year, we have one section of 4K at one of our elementaries. We could risk running class sizes like 15, 14, two sections of that versus, or one's changing the policy and running a very big class. So we have to weigh those factors too moving forward, given our en enrollment trends at the lower elementary. As more kids are graduating, bigger classes are graduating than are coming in. So my question is related to the assumption <coughs> of current and next year's enrollment projection. We're, we're simply assuming, based on the numbers provided, that, that we'll retain 100% of the 4K students, which I think is a reasonable assumption um, and though I think we've done an excellent job of marketing 4k which by the way 4k enrollment is <laughs> is open and we have an open house coming up at the end of the month at all of our elementary schools do we foresee or what was the thought process by assuming that there are zero four-year-olds not in our program coming into our district there's, there's not, we, we don't have a handle on how many are staying in private schools that offer 4K, 5K, and on. 
as well as um, we're working to get the number of enrolled 4K students in private non-religious institutes. So like a daycare provider, because they don't have a choice next year. They can't go to 5K in those providers. But we don't have that clean data because this, the village does not have, I worked in districts where you get census data and you can project out from birth to 4K within like 80 to 90% accuracy. We don't have that here. So we're going on assumptions mm -hmm. and our best cause is just roll up data. We're going on assumptions versus uh, educated assumptions. Right, versus data informed decision making as we had many <laughs> presentations this evening. So, mm -hmm. so I, under I understand your, your objections to the proposal. I just, we're, we're looking at it administratively as um, stabilization, retaining quality people, and um, making sure we're maximizing our space. But um, your, your thoughts are noted. And you, you, like I said, we, you could decide this evening to accept no open enrollment seats, and then we reconvene around this topic in June once um, the open enrollment window closes. And Melissa, correct me if I'm wrong, because you pulled that for me today. Once the open enrollment closes on June 7th, then we have not filled any seats because you didn't approve any, then we could open seats if we see that Amy Bell's running a section of, you know, two sections of 12 kids or whatever it might be. Are we gonna allow at least six seats there to up those class sizes? Because over at MacArthur, they're running 25 or 24. They're maxing up the class size policy. That's the other thing is the distribution across the district. That's why tonight's recommendation was not for specific schools like it's done in the past, because we don't have to determine schools until June. It was for grade level, because then we can monitor enrollment per building and distribute accordingly to level the playing field with class size. This is very much a hypothetical, so I understand your answer could be very vague. Uh, but obviously in the village there's been more development in certain areas than others and so if uh, if we run into the situation where we fill these seats and we get higher than expected meaning we our assumption here is met and exceeded how do we handle situations in general where I'm going to use MacArthur as an example where we're full at MacArthur but we have residents in the MacArthur area. So we, if the assumption is, is those that are open enrolling in would be placed in MacArthur, and we have this influx in the MacArthur school, then we, we get to shift. We can we, put the open enrollment kids wherever we want. The resident students within their boundary, that's their home school unless per policy, they reach out to me directly and the, saying, I really like my child to go to X school, then I work with the principal, we look at class size and demographic, and we do and don't approve those, but those are few and far between. MacArthur would be probably the last school we distribute to because there is <coughs> apartment complexes, and we, see, we again, since I've been here, we monitor summer enrollment, and we see an influx at MacArthur in August as that's the new time for leases to come forward. So right now, I believe, and Katie, correct me if I'm wrong, Amy Bell, we have three sections of kindergarten and we are projecting two next year. Rockfield, we have three sections <coughs> of kindergarten, we are projecting one. That is why, where most likely the distribution would go with possible sprinkling here and there at County Line and MacArthur. What's the deadline for us to approve open enrollment seats for the current The January period. board meeting. So by, by the conclusion of January. Okay, so if we wanted to take no action tonight and try to get more information from the village, we'd have to reconvene before the end of the month to right. finalize it. That's why I would, I would recommend you don't approve that we can reopen if need be versus approving if you're not, if that's not the will of the group. But I th I, my, my belief in our administrative team is that um, the number of seats we will be able to manage and distribute across the district this coming year. I 
I support this. It's different than what we've done in the past, but I think it's a somewhat bold idea. I, I believe what Chris is saying, it's a way of kind of stabilizing the school district. We're here to educate students and I think it's a good idea if we can start them early in our district. So why would we deny uh, students in need, you might say, to start here in kindergarten? I think it's a good idea and we should go ahead with it. Um, one question I have, is there any additional state aid that comes in besides what we get from the other school district? You know, that would be the result of the September headcount. Sure. I'm sorry. So when we do the headcount, we um, see how many students are sitting in our seats that day for both um, September and January. We then subtract all the open enrolled students in, and we add in all the open enrollment students out. So our funding is based on our resident students, not necessarily the ones that are sitting in our seats. So the other school then gets to count them because then they pay us. Does that make sense? So we will get the $11,000 for a student that open and rolls out to us, out from us, but then we will have to pay the other district the 9000 ish dollars. So we will keep $2,000. Vice versa if they're coming into our district. But that is not state aid. That's revenue limit. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> also, um, transportation is provided by the family. We don't transport. And uh, additionally, there's truancy law related to open enrollment. If you are found truant, which is 10 or more days of unexcused medical or family excused um, absences, you have, and we run a truancy meeting, um, which our principals do a very nice job of that. The student then, the following semester, loses their open enrollment status and has to go back to their home district. And so, every time about this time of year since it's semester melissa reaches out to the principals does an attendance count on our current open enroll to make sure they're complying with state statute and if they're not we hold in a truancy meeting and they lose their open enroll status so there's expectations related to attendance and once you're in you're not just in if we follow through with that on an administrative level i would assume will, yours would yeah um because they're, they're not here and we're responsible for them. So if they're not a resident, then we don't need to be responsible. We did, you, you had mentioned internal district open enrollment, meaning uh, contact you, your administration team, uh, for a family that would like to be in a different building. So if we have an Amy Bell in a Rockfield with diminishing enrollment, um, while they have, let's say, diminishing enrollment, I would project the village is planning on housing developments to go into those areas. We've already seen buildings start. And one, one thing Germantown does have is area for residential growth. Uh, they've mentioned they're done with the first round of, um, we'll call it the first round, but the, the plan side of adding jobs, building commercial, <coughs> manufacturing, that type of thing. And now they're gonna focus on residential. Um, so we have that coming, right? One way or the other, that's not tomorrow that's a projected growth right. um, but the village does have that as we see towns like Menominee Falls and Mequon fill their available land districts such as Sussex Hamilton and Germantown have the available land and lot size is desirable by many um, going back to where that started doesn't that offer us a pressure relief valve for some of our overpopulated or more populated elementary schools such as Mac and County Line internally couldn't we offer our internal which would also then help um, maintain a staff level or normalize staffing stabilize it at Rock and Amy Bell internally with 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 our kids within this district? Yeah, <laughs> however, there's no transportation provided in that respect. So you're, you're saying if families can provide or have the means to provide their own transportation, then they, they can move inter-district. Um, 
But if we see enrollment, I always put when I work with our principals caveats around attendance. They have to be in good standing attendance mm -hmm. about our attendance policy. They provide their own transportation. And if there's a spike in enrollment that make the class size larger than expectations of this community and our staff, then you're moving back to your home district. But within our district, <coughs> given the vertical Correct. alignment we're So if some a MacArthur family says, I really want to go to Amy Bell because, and they have a sound rationale, not because Russ is friends at the school, but mm -hmm. we used to live in that neighborhood, now we've moved, and it'll be their last year at Amy Bell, we want them to go to fifth grade. But I'm saying proactively as a district. This isn't the families asking. But we float, we have open enrollment here internally within the district. Uh, we've heard complaints, I've heard complaints on this board, not only about uh, student population size in, in those other two schools, but also the start time of one of them. Sure. We may have parents that could jump all, all over that, potentially, obviously if we're not bringing both kids or all of the kids across different grades, that's a different story. But I'm just saying there's, there's an internal option to apply an open enrollment more so than there's an external. And if we would come across one of those situations where we would say, okay, the spike has occurred, we need you to return to your home school, we've now brought that vertical alignment from school to school, that that transition for that kid wouldn't be nearly as difficult, um, as well as we'd have the easier flexibility because it's an internal district at open enrollment open enrollment, I'll call it. Internal district transfer. Transfer. That's the name of the there policy. You go. Um, versus an external open enrollment in which we would have to find cause. Yeah, I, I, I understand what you're saying and the logic behind it. I would just throw caution at that. That policy is written for special circumstance and not, that's why we have boundaries, right? And, sure. and that could lead to then a high fluctuation because I don't like the start time at a school, or I don't like the teacher at this grade level, which that's not the purpose of the policy. The purpose of the policy is for special circumstances, and then the three that we've approved in two years, they've been unique circumstances, maybe a split family, something like that. But now it's advantageous of the district to do it, not the family. Or it co-aligns advantageously with both, right? Sure. It, it does lose the concept of neighborhood type schools I, in the village. I, I understand that, but we're talking about a unique situation and you're bringing a number that's never been heard in this district as far as open enrollment. So yeah. before we, I would jump to that, without talking about it in totality, right, in every avenue the ability to address it, uh, I would, given the unknown factors, um, I would not support bringing in 36 open enrollment students um, at a level, and I, and I truly do believe we run into a risk until our residential takes off of having to do it the following year. And even if it's 20 and then 15, we're still on a wheel of reduced dollar amount with an unknown cost based on the kid that's coming. I, I couldn't support it. Anything else? Understanding the concerns and uh, hearing Dr. Reuter kind of explain some of the nuances with open enrollment and what <clears throat> we can do if there are any sort of issues that pop up or other concerns that pop up. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to vote for this. Um, I think in the grand scheme of things, certainly there could be some some issues that pop up with this and, and other things. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, with some of the information we shared that came from the village, I think that's really our, our bigger concern in the grand scheme of things over time. So um, I'm going to vote for this. I just feel like more information before we just make a decision on something that we, we don't know. So as far as, like I said, what the village is going to do as far as, you know, adding apartments, whether it's next-gen housing, whether, you know, to see, kind of have an idea of what the expectation is so that we're not, again, having to put a bunch of kids in open enrollment and then all of a sudden now there's not room for them and they have to go find another school. I don't think that that necessarily helps kids. I think just 
information as far as how do our open enrollment students do? Are they, you know, successful academically? Are they successful, you know, are they disciplined? Just kind of having a little bit more information before we just make a decision on 36 kids. I, I would just caution that the, the provisions under the statute are not, you cannot select based on criteria for open enrollment. It's random draw. So we can provide the Excuse academic me. performance. I don't know that I can go deep into the behavioral data with the board because that now specifies our open enrollment students. Um, but that, that could be discriminatory that we're not accepting seats because they don't do well in school. I, I can argue that kids who are open enrolled, now I, we can get the data, might exceed our expectations or even the expectations of the peers that live in the residence because they're working for something that's an opportunity that wasn't there previously from a home school. Do we have a number of kids that open enroll out of Germantown? Brittany, would you mind answering that number out? Currently, there is uh, open enrolled out regular ed, 142, and special ed open enrolled out is 23. It, I, it was hard to hear. I'm sorry. Thing. Open enrolled out regular ed, because there's two different categories. Regular ed is 142. Open enrolled out special ed, 23. I have in numbers as well. Can you give them, do you have oval open? Do you know the number in? Sorry? Number of open enrolled in? Uh, regular ed open enrolled in 70. And special ed open enrolled in nine. So we have 79 current students that are open enrolled in, and we've lost 165 out during the course of their, that can range in multiple grade levels. So then does that balance out as far as the, if you have about the same number um, that are going out as coming in as open enrollment, it kind of balances out that $3,000. That is, you know, we get $11,000, right? And then only 8,500 comes in from students, is that correct? You guys are talking about before. So currently in the budget we have for revenue $733,000 coming in and we have uh, $1.5 million going out, a little more than $1.5 million going out. Tom? It, I don't know how the vote's gonna go, but if we approve zero seats, does that mean next month you're coming to us with non-renewal notices for or a lower staffing plan? We have, we are waiting for final draw from middle school and high school registration because again that determines our FTE at the elementary. It sounds goofy but it does. Based on the number of total FTE we need for what the courses our kids select, both core and elective courses, then that tears down to now what's our enrollment projections which was shared this evening at each grade level and then we break that down by school and we look at what's our current staffing plan Who's retiring? Because that still, Mike, when is the retirement deadline? February 15th. So that would play in too. We can't make decisions until after that because we need to know who's retiring because that, that all has ramifications to what our non-renewal process would be, which is March. May. May, I'm sorry. Yeah, May. May 15th is final notice. Which, which enrollment could go up, but it could stay exactly the same at kindergarten through 12th grade or not deviate much, 4K is the one that we had high enrollment in the summer. We've had open house at every elementary for 4K and we've had we've publicized both kindergarten and 4K registration. But until things are in target and says go back to school, some parents don't act. They say, go, oh, that's right, I gotta enroll my kindergartner who might have been at Momentum. And they don't even have a mental <laughs> model around school and so I got a couple questions. Um, knowing some of the uh, alternative care uh, private companies around here have held a non-enrollment if you were looking for half day to mm -hmm. counteract when we opened 4K, which 
and I'll call that predatory, right? It's disservice to the community. But I understand why they're doing it. They have a business and they're running it. So I'm not going to get into that side of it. But we have a data set there that we don't know how many that is that will be here for a full day 5K um, that, that, are, that have been beholden to that because they didn't have a choice. They needed full day care right. for their child. Um, so I, don't, I think we're missing a number there. And that's where if you approve zero seats tonight, we could have a clearer picture with that coming forward. So then, for this year, I understand this is a move for projection forward, but for this year, for this coming year, how does enrolling 36 students at two at 5K across what is most likely two schools and a couple maybe here or there affect somebody in the middle school as far as the staffing plan? Well, it, it adds two sections to the elementary where we already know we're lacking kindergarten, but, but which what I'm, stabilizes what I'm asking is, the middle school. But, but this year, you're telling me you would recommend a non-renewal of someone in middle school because we didn't fill a track or two in K-5. I, I don't know that in middle school we have to look at licensure. So we moved people do you, do you under, before do, do you from second grade to seventh grade because they have a one nine license. Is that ideal? No. But we. Yeah, but how does second grade and seventh grade play into a decision we're making on K-5 this year? I'm not saying it doesn't down the road because obviously that rotates through and builds class size as it moves forward. I understand that. But I'm talking about as far as a staffing plan, how does that come about for the decision making if process? If we are able year? to fulfill all 36 seats, that's two sections. There's possible retirement at the elementary level where of a couple and possibly a couple more. And then with the, the belief that there's going to be an increased enrollment, that would at least alleviate such a high number as jump from 8 to 14 when it comes to staffing. A reduction from 14 uh, down to 8. Do Dr. Reuter made reference to <clears throat> the potential overlap between elementary and middle. Of the three levels, that's definitely true. Elementary and middle <clears throat> would have the most overlap. So if there's a shortage at the elementary level and there's an excess at at KMS, it might mean reduction at KMS, or vice versa. It, it might mean movement of teachers. But if we're recommending 36 at 5K, we're not saying we're a shortage at the middle school. We're saying we're a shortage at 5K it, specifically. It was, it was an if. Yeah. Right. But what we're being asked to do right now, and I'll we'll cut to it, are, is there staff we want to retain based off of, in the way to do that, is increase enrollment through open enrollment? Or are we financially going to listen to what our enrollment data says for our students and our tax base? Our tax base. It's not a good decision either way, I understand that. But for this year, how does that? It doesn't. To me, it doesn't. It maintains three tracks at in the 5K, one of which we added last year because of an increased class size, right? At, at Rockfield, yep, and the other was in MacArthur. So we added, we made the adjustment to bring in staffing when we needed it. Why wouldn't we look at reducing staffing when our citizens, our community are telling us we don't? And I'm, I understand the finite, and I understand staff's going to take that as they're trying to get rid of us. That is not the case. This is an honest conversation around this while also then putting an unknown jeopardy of 36 students in our hands from outside of this community. And you're telling us if they come up with an IEP, cut them. So financially, it's OK I'm not, I'm not telling you we're going to do that. I'm telling you that's an option. It so, is. Yeah. It's but what if the 36 students, uh, we know the dollar amount one to one from a student of special needs to a standard student, however we want to use the political term for that, is drastically more. Yeah. Brittany spoke to it tonight, what, 33% reimbursement of a student with an IEP, right? You spoke to that tonight in finance, that it costs more with a student with an IEP. We know that. That's, but it's our obligation. Service our, uh, our uh, residents. 100% agree. 100% agree. But we're saying if we bring them in, we cut them. 
if it became too expensive. If it wasn't financially in our favor to keep. That's a game I'm not willing to play. Mr. Biden. Overall, I support adding some at kindergarten just to give us the opportunity to balance class sizes across our elementary schools. I don't know that 36 is the right number. I guess I, I, if you can share, if there is any insight as to how you arrived at 36. It's two sections of 18, but it would be distributed. And it wouldn't be like we had two classes of just open enrolled kids, but in schools where we know our kindergarten numbers are down, we could distribute those kids with the current resident kids. Could have gone higher. I mean, <laughs> I based understand. on our current model for staffing, if we wanted to maintain the same. Yeah, I have to think. I know think it's, it's, this is something this board, historical board members, even community residents, this hasn't ever been brought forward because one, we never had a class size policy until tonight, and two, the previous formula that was being used by administration didn't make sense. I'll be on the record to say that. We were looking at the average class size of 15. So that's why there was never, there was never a, more than one or two or three or four kids brought forward and always at fifth grade, which still didn't make sense because the schools that they were at were tipping as close to being needing three sections. So um, this is something that I'm, I was aware of in other districts I've worked in, that we, we work to maintain stability and this is a method, so that's why I brought it forward. This is new. And I understand the, the concerns related to why um, the, the caution towards it. Brittany just gave us the numbers, and we've got more uh, open enrollments out, almost double of open enrollments in. So this is a, we should at least be able to even that number. And 36 students doesn't even get us to even. So I don't think there's an issue with going with the number 36. As far as um, the district being overrun down the road, the village could approve 100 building permits before the end of the week, and we're not going to see any students from that for years. We've been down this road before. We thought maybe as a result of the referendum, we would be overrun, you know, by new building and new building permits for homes. And to some extent, uh, building permits have increased because of the referendum. Uh, look at our tech ed classes. We we may have the best tech ed facilities in the state right here. So what's happened is uh, enrollment may have not dropped as fast as it otherwise would have, but we weren't overrun with new enrollments just because we did a referendum. So we're here to educate students. I think we should show that we're here to educate students and take the 36. You know, who knows in that group of students who we would be denying if we don't take them. And Chris, or Dr. Reuter, I should say, just said we could have gone higher. So I, to me, it seems like a 30, the 36 is a uh, number that's safe. And if you don't do that as this uh, small K-5 class, uh, let's say we approve zero, the K-5 class will be small next year. That wave goes through the uh, school district for the next 12 grades or 11 grades, depending on how you look at it. So. Just because it's new doesn't mean we shouldn't try it. I think we can try it and um, reevaluate one year from today. You know, we'll but, see how it goes. But the revaluation tool on that is not removing the 36 kids without no, cause. No, we wouldn't do that. So there's no, you can't reevaluate it. Then you we have would the reevaluate if we accept open enrollments, 36 more, the following year. If the district's year over year accepting 36 enrollment seats, we're financially doing a disservice to our taxpayers. Not necessarily. Um, there's a couple of ways of looking at it. 
Um, one thing that's happened over the years is it, it, it's been a while, so I can't give you the exact number, and I, I'm not going to put Brittany on the spot to give it to us, but um, occasionally we would get an email where the taxpayer says, I'm saving the district money by sending my student to private school. And my response was, well, actually, I support your right uh, to send your students to private school. However, you're actually costing us more in state aid than your taxes are that are coming to the school district. So it costs us money for every student that's enrolled in a private school. And I, I'm fine with that. You, you know, if parents want to send their students to private school, that's fine. We need to compete with those private schools and show that we're better. And I think accepting open enrollments, especially when we have an unbalance, I think the number, uh, you're testing my short-term memory here, but I think it was 74 in and 140 something out. Uh, I didn't write the numbers down, so I'm sorry. 79 in 165. Oh, okay. So <laughs> it is actually about a two to one ratio. I don't know what we're worried about. And if the, if the 36 seems ballooned, I, you know, I, I pulled, and Mr. Ewart, I understand your, your firsthand experience with don't waste a seat, right? they're not going to accept, but we've had over the last three years on average 13 to 15 kids apply for kindergarten. So if it is a reduction to one section of 18 kids, and we look at that distribution across the district, um, that might be a start to this methodology and idea um, versus 36, which I understand is, is a lot in, compared to a handful of previous years. Yeah, I just don't see how we get off the hamster wheel we go down this path. If we artificially inflate our enrollment numbers to maintain staffing, we will continue to have to do that. Sure. Yeah. Are we assuming that enrollment's going to keep declining or come back up and when? Keep declining. Keep declining. I mean, uh, so I just want to give some information. Yeah. We continue, as you are aware, have um, graduating classes in 12th grade that are much larger than our kindergartners coming in. So we're in the 300th range for graduating classes, and we're in the 200th number of kids coming into kindergarten in 4K. I mean, bringing them into 4K earlier is great, but our numbers are a lot lower as the years are going on in larger graduating classes. Um, I understand the housing that could happen. Um, it's not, I don't believe, going to happen once it gets approved, I think it's going to take a little while, as Mr. Loth stated. Um, if we approve 36, the average is 15 that have applied. So we could, is it 15 aroundish for the last three years? 12, 14, and 16. Okay. So 13.75. So, and I understand the hamster wheel continually, but we haven't had open enrollment in the past, and we continue to lose kids on open enrolling out. So. I would recommend if we want to go 36 that we start doing something because what we were doing had zero data behind it. They literally were just pulling numbers and approving them. There was no information behind why it was the numbers or the grades that they chose. So I think this is a good start. And if it's not 36, I think it should be something. Um, we're doing kindergarten because of the reasons he stated. It's starting from the bottom. Are there spaces in other places of the school district? Yeah, there are. But starting at kindergarten, I think, is a good place to start a student off into a district. <coughs> so when, when we're talking about kids leaving the district, and we have to pay that cost, kids coming into the district, that's what we refer to as shared cost, correct? Mm-hmm. Okay, that, that figures into the equalization aid formula. Well, that's a different shared cost, but yes. Are, are we negative or positive right now? We're negatively aided. Mm -hmm. So if we're, if we're negative... In tertiary aid, there's three levels of aid, correct? Tertiary aid, if you're in tertiary aid, you're negatively aided. We are. We're um, reducing that each year as we restructure our debt, which is another factor into the equalization aid calculation. So. 
each year we are getting less and less negatively aided. I was going to say, we'll, we'll see a decrease in state aid. Correct. Okay. You, you spoke earlier about the enrollment exemption. Declining enrollment exemption, Declining which enrollment has nothing exemption. to do with open enrollment. No, but you, oh, sorry. wouldn't we qualify for it? We would qualify for a declining enrollment exemption if our three-year average of the September count is less than the three-year average of the prior year September count, not including anything to do with open enrollment. Open enrollment students are taken in and out. So during our count, so what you're looking at, the open enrolled students that leave us are taken into consideration to your count. The open enrolled students that are coming into us are part of that district's count, not ours. Okay. We, we keep, we, we talk about Germantown, uh, the growth of Germantown. We represent several villages here, and there's a lot of growth going in in Jackson also. So, I mean, if, if we're going to follow up with Germantown, we should probably be following up with Jackson and take a look at the growth rates there. You know, in regards to the next gen housing that uh, the village is discussing this tonight, uh, there's two uh, municipalities that have backed away from it. Jackson is not one of them. Jackson has jumped in with both feet. Um, and they are the first to actually build and launch the housing, housing um, call it market. But they, they're actually on the process of building these houses as we speak. I'm not sure if those are in our district, though, are they? Uh, that development? No, but they have vacant land that is. Right. And I know the village is, the, the county lead discussion is this evening oh, yeah. pointing out 10 different site locations within Germantown for this same type of housing. Not one location, 10 different potential locations. Uh, the distinction being Jackson owned their land um, so they could provide it to that project at a reduced cost. Uh, the, the county would be asking Germantown to procure the land and then provide it at a reduced cost. Uh, we'll get into the village politics side of it. I find that to be a little bit of a stretch of ever occurring, given the financial restraints they're under right now. But that's the discussion that's happening in a building down the block. Now, the more I think about this, sure, I'd like to have housing data and new construction data, but I don't know that that has a huge impact on kindergarten because someone could buy a house that has a third and a seventh grader. Correct. You know, that doesn't affect what we're talking about tonight. Correct. It, 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 does. it, it, it does because those seats that are being filled in kindergarten, the housing's going to take place over years. So you don't want that mass moving through the system as people move in and to your point with older kids and all of a sudden we go, we don't have room for our own citizens. Yeah. Fifth and sixth graders come in as this 36 hit fifth or sixth grade and now we're overpopulated and we're going to expand staffing at that. Not I, I, I'm not sure I can say whether you're for, or me personally can say whether I'm for or against it based on that, but from a risk mitigation standpoint, doing something about it now that you can't claw back, or if you do claw back, it looks pretty messy and the optics on that are not good, or waiting another year, what's the cost break even or analysis on that? This would be our first year going from the, the, the I will call it, um, I think we have untrue numbers at our 4K program. So uh, we'll see what that actually transfers over to 5K this year. And I'm not saying do zero. Historically, we, we don't do zero. We do something. To your point, and to, to Chris's point in the administration, that's changed. We make those decisions based off of data, which were not occurring before. So we're not ignoring that side of it. Any continued discussion? I would ask that regardless of the motion this evening, we make sure that the motion states um, that the current students who are open enrolled as well as tuition waiver 
remain here. Oh, yeah. um, we don't lose sight of that so that when the what's, mold, what's the, the what's been what's the average number of applicants that we've had? Overall. The, the ones that have asked that have been denied. So Melissa, this includes people who applied for 4K last year and don't even have 4K seats. Um, 2021-2022 20, is 127 total. No, no, no. Applicants for open enrollment. Yep. Or the historical data that you brought. For 5K or total? 5K. 5K, 2021-22 is 16. 22-23 is 14. And 23-24 is 12. Knowing we didn't have seats, they still applied. Okay. So I, originally I wondered if we could even fill 36 kindergarten seats. I don't know that we can based on what we just heard. So I think we should go ahead and approve them. You'll fill and, 36 and, seats. And we'll see what happens. I, no I, I don't, I don't I know that we will. I have 100% confidence. As a parent that went through it, I know the network of parents that the, the conversation that occurs, you'll okay. fill 36 seats. I, I and think, if it's 34, I'm sorry. I think but. we can handle them. I think uh, the reason why I ask for those numbers is those are the ones that have applied even knowing we didn't have seats want to be here. They We're, wanted to be here so bad that they applied even knowing we didn't have seats. Remember, Brittany stated the graduating classes are all bigger than the kindergarten classes coming in. And this isn't my area of ex expertise, but I believe that statewide enrollments are down. Every school district in the state is down. So obviously there could be an exception here or there. So public school, um, yeah. Those students are obfuscating to uh, private school. Right. Sixty so percent in Wisconsin it, districts. It, and, it, and if that's the case, then the community is saying we're looking for alternative options to what you're offering, not continue to staff. I don't like the decision in either direction it goes because there's a hard staffing decision that would result from this. I understand that. Well, but but ultimately, our tax base is what it is, and, and the children, our potential student base that lives in it is what it is. We can swim upstream and say we'll just float it for this year and float it for this year, and that becomes a uh, revolving door. I'm not saying that occurs. They can be very well right, and the housing goes, and it worked. I just don't see it, the, the balancing act that it takes. We're trying to, you know, thread a needle at that point with a very expensive uh, ramification if, if it doesn't go well. But remember, we've got double the students going out that we have open enrolled coming in. So this is... I don't know how much of a problem that really is, but I think uh, we can start to correct that this evening. Well, another way to look at it is <clears throat> based off projections, first grade is projected uh, for 24-25, 246. We're projecting 5K, 146. If we don't address this, that obviously I'm making a big assumption that these numbers don't increase, decrease, but this staffing issue will carry forward several years potentially. Correct. So that's the other consideration in this. Is, is yeah. Do we right size the staff? Correct, I 100% agree. I think there's been other approaches from this board. Uh, I, I'll, I'll cite two arguments I've heard from this board. Uh, one in regards to the village and housing and the type of housing they're building and that they shouldn't build certain types of housing because we don't have the room in our schools for it heard that argument. I've also heard the board attempt to approach a, uh, a different strategy to uh, enact some an open enrollment and many districts around us did through an online academy. Uh, I, I was involved in that at one point and saw kind of the inner workings and strategy behind it. Unfortunately the administration in place at the time uh, did not have the skills to pull it off. There was some want within the district. Some of the people are in this room and worked really hard on that project. Um, and that was a legitimate attempt that could negligate, or could um, negate, negate, sorry, the word I'm looking for. Uh, some of the risk that we are trying to manage while bringing in students, the 
without having to worry about overrun class sizes and uh, staffing issues. Uh, that, that was a legitimate attempt. I think there was some within the administration uh, that are no longer here. One uh, at the helm that probably had no understanding or very little understanding as to the workings of it, so they couldn't educate and didn't educate the board properly on, 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 on the ins and outs of how that would function. Uh, and another that wanted to uh, uh, turn that project into something beyond uh, a financial asset for the district. Now we have districts around us that took advantage of those programs, opening, open, and that's where some of these open enrollment students go, is these online academies. And it might be the right learning system for them. But the, those districts are profiting while spending low dollar amounts. They aren't spending close to eight grand on each one of those kids to have them open enrolled. So they're plus money. The downside is, isn't, isn't there. This board has done some work in this area. It's not an easy decision. Um, any other discussion? I do just want to say quickly, when I started here three years ago, I looked into open enrollment, an open enrollment out, and I also looked at it in my other districts. Um, there's, when families move into a school district, they usually obviously move in because of the community and, and what they like about the area that lives in. If their children have already established friends at their past school district, you'll see that that's why a lot of people open enroll out. So they could move into the developments that so are we, here, and they could continue to open and roll yeah. out to their original and, school. And we have, I know of situations that we have in our school where people have moved out of the community but kept their students enrolled in our district. Correct, as yeah, long as we accept the open enrolled in. So I mean that, it, I'm just saying it works both, both Correct. directions. Correct, that we just have more going out, so it would say that more are living here because it's a great community but keeping their children's relationships. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think we have three options on the table for you to decide tonight. Either make a motion to vote on the recommendation, make a motion to vote on a reduced number, or make a motion to vote on no seats and revisit um, in June after June 7th, um, after we, the open enrollment window closes to determine if we're going to reopen our open enrollment window for those who apply at whatever grade level we so choose, specifically kindergarten. I think we do need to address, obviously, the, you know, the, the lower enrollment. Obviously, we need to keep our student count at a relatively consistent level. But yeah, we kind of talked earlier, is this going to be a trend where every year we're adding 36 more students? We're trying to, but if, en if enrollment is going down across the board, across the state, at some point there is going to be a reduction in, in enrollment anyway. So what at what point, how, how long do we keep this this going as far as adding open enrollment students that we want to try and keep it at you know 240 students a class or at some point are we going to have to accept the fact that just enrollment is going to be less because there's less kids in the state so when do we kind of do we do this now where we instead of doing 36 we do 18 or 20 just add one class and then to kind of see where we go instead of you know, at some point we're going to have to address the fact there's just, just less kids. Right. So I would be comfortable obviously adding, you know, we could talk about just doing one class of kids. I'll make a motion. Make a motion to approve 15 new open enrollment seats at 5K the 24-25 school year and the addition for applicants and existing students already attending Germantown schools that have moved to approve the zero special edu and moved to approve the zero special education seats for the 24-25 school year. Second. OK. 
Okay, so the, any of you? Yeah, we've got 15 here. 15 is the most. Fif 15, you said. Um, will we still have an opportunity to reevaluate in June? Yes. Okay. This, this, we always, this allows reserve, we for, always reserve that, right? Yep. So this allows for, if, if, if it moves forward with a majority vote, so it'll allow 15 seats at kindergarten in the district. That could mean five kids at each school. Or, sorry, that's terrible math. <laughs> but it could be distributed across five schools. So it could be, you know, four kids, five kids, at each, or four kids at each school. Given the track size, I would assume Correct. it would be focused on two schools. Correct. And if, then, and then if not there, one, given the number we approved. Yep, it's not going to be one section. But then, Michael, to your question, we'll come back with uh, staff where we're at from an enrollment report in the June board meeting, and we can open up the recommendation to open another 15 seats or what 10 seats sure. or whatever it might be. Okay. Any other discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? Hearing none, that passes. Okay, that was item A. 9B, discussion and action 2426 administrator contracts. Dr. Reuter. Uh, yeah, I need to find my sheet, sorry. Um, I'm recommending this evening the outlined administrators for to enter the district, uh, I'm sorry, the board to enter into contracts for the uh, two year contracts as the, as the maximum allotment um, per state statute for the 24 through 26 school year um, at their no less than their current 23 24 salaries there's an attached um, a contract that's been reviewed by legal um, any necessary changes um, the first reading took place with the board previously um, and there's one administrator missing it's mr rooney i did share it tonight i wish to state his name he started this year he's the only administrator not on a two the current cycle, everyone else is up for this year. So rather than issuing him a one-year contract extension, um, next year I'll bring him forward for a new two-year contract as well. He agreed to that. So okay. doing, he's, he's doing a great job. There's nothing yeah. wrong with <laughs> it. But he's the only one not on the same cycle and to keep everyone else on the same cycle. Well, I understand he was approached to see what you would be more comfortable with. Yes, correct. he gave me the thumbs up. I okay. said, you're not losing your job. You're doing a great job. Yeah. So. Please nobody read into that. <laughs> Correct. Any discussion? How about a motion? I'll take a motion. <laughs> then we can have this. <laughs> Move to approve the administrative contracts for Germantown School District administrators presented for the 24-26 school years with salary increases to be determined after July 1st, 2024 and an overall percentage amount determined by the board and individual administrator amounts determined by the superintendent. A second. Mr. Pollock with the motion, Ms. Higginbotham with the second. Any discussion? Mr. Long. I'd just like to add that uh, all the administrators' salaries are public record and they are published here in, you know, this particular uh, packet, uh, just like the uh, teachers' salaries were published uh, at our last board meeting. That's it. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? Hearing none, that passes. 9C, discussion and action approved in DECA overnight travel request. Mr. Reuter. Yes, the state DECA competition, Distributive Education Clubs of America, also known as the Association of Marketing Students, will um, be competing February 26th to the 28th in Lake Geneva, 20 students and two advisors will be going on the trip. Uh, students will be paying for the registration and lodging and transportation costs, which is outlined here, along with all their advisor expenses, um, will be covered by the Germantown School District using the GHS Athletics and Activities budget. We're looking for um, approval of overnight travel this evening. Take a motion. Move to approve the overnight travel request for 20 students and two advisors to travel to Lake Geneva from February 26th through 28th, 2024 to attend the DECA state competition as presented. 
second. Mr. Pollock with the motion, Ms. Higginbotham with the second. Any discussion? I have one question on the applicant form, date submitted to building principal, date submitted to superintendent's office. Those are blank. Um, are they just not on this copy or? I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't hear. Uh, for the date submitted to building principal and date submitted to superintendent's office, those dates are blank on the uh, overnight field trip request form. Oh, I'm, that was just submitted, wondering. this was submitted last week, correct? Correct. Yeah, correct. It's, it's blank. Um, it was one of the things, it was one of those where it popped up. We have kids qualified, I've, I've, rushed to get it into the board packet and agenda. So perfect. I believe it was Wednesday of last week, the 11th hour. I think we can mark it as an incomplete. But. Yep. We'll take some points off. But yeah. Uh, beyond that, I just noticed that those were empty. Yeah, these, these forms, sometimes we get them handwritten, sometimes we see them uh, typed out. I appreciate it's typed out because I can actually legibly read everything that's on here yeah other than the two missing dates which are generally irrelevant um, other than planning mr Lowe. yes i uh, wish to commend dr reuter for defining uh d-e-c-a i was trying to come up with uh some text or some words for that uh, would have been you know, I'll, I'll let it go but um i love these type of uh, events They'll be, uh, for the students that participate, they will learn a lot on this trip, I guarantee it. These are great events, and I'm happy to see that uh, we've got uh, students participating. And to Mr. Martin, he consistently has a group I, every yeah. six months, it seems like we're approving a DECA thing. Trip, yep. So. Yeah, I would uh, echo both of those statements. It's fantastic. I, I believe when I was in high school, I participated in this, but it wasn't called, I don't think it was called DECA then, I don't remember the Might have changed over the years. acronym. Yeah, it was just a you know, couple years ago. Uh, any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 That passes. Tent, closed session. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to enter into closed session pursuant to Wisconsin State Statute 1980.85 sub 1 sub C to consider employment promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of an employee. A, district administrator contract. B, personnel matters. So, so moved. moved. <laughs> I'll second that. <laughs> Mr. Barney with the motion. Mr. Pollock with the second. All in favor? Roll call. Oh, Aye. Sorry, roll call. Oh. Ewart. Here. Myself, yes. I assume it's a yes. Yes, I Yes. Loth? Yes. Pollock? Yes. Higginbotham? Yes. Brown? Yes. Uh, it's my understanding we intend to exit out of closed and we'll open. We'll here for action as needed. Um, uh, post discussion here if it's needed. Um, so stick around if you'd like. Otherwise, thank you for coming. Please drive safe. We are enclosed at 918. Germantown School District Board of Education is entering back into open session at 1016 p.m. Can I entertain a motion? Uh, motion to approve the administrator contract for Christopher Reuter for the 2024 through 2026 school years. Second. We have a motion from Mr. Barney. I have a second from Ms. Higginbotham. Any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes. Congratulations. Thank you. I will take a second motion. Motion to approve the resignation of Thomas Kiwava, effective January 19th, 2024. Second. Mr. Barney with the motion, Ms. Higginbotham with the second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any against or any nays? Seeing none, that passes. I will take one final motion. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. Ms. Higginbotham with the motion, Mr. Loaf with the second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned at 10.17 p.m.